So today we'll talk to Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, how are you doing? So Mike is a software engineer at Vouch and a core contributor to Clojure Script Compiler. Mike is also a creator of Replete, uh, which is a REPL that runs on your iPhone. So we will talk to Mike about contributing to Clojure Script Compiler and how you can become a contributor and support this amazing project. Uh, so you can think about this conversation as an onboarding to the project. So Mike, mm -hmm. where do we start? So there was a time prior to me happen, having ever contributed the, to the compiler, so I can try to remember <laughs> back to those days. And I think when I, when I was thinking about it back then, it's like an intimidating thing, right? You're like, man, it's yeah. a compiler. Uh, this thing's probably horrifically complicated. Um, and uh, so, so that might be worth talking about, like, what the compiler actually does. And, and maybe with going through that, we can... Um, I might be able to convince you that it's actually not that complicated and it's not that, not that scary. <laughs> Um, right. For one, one thing, it's all written in Clojure. So um, it's a language that you already know or, or, or are learning, you know, right. too. that makes it a lot easier to, at least for me, to figure out what's going on in there. Um, mm -hmm. And what we could do is we could talk about like how the compiler is broken up into different parts or phases and whatnot, and maybe talk about those pieces and what they do. So you can like, you know, have like the the, the lay of the land. high level architecture yeah yeah because then then that would like if you you know if you're if you're going to contribute to the compiler um it, oftentimes it's to fix a bug to be honest right you know you're, you're something is broken for you and and you'd like to know like okay what part of the compiler is causing this bug um you know where mm -hmm. could it potentially be breaking um right so so what would be the parts of the compiler where would we start so there's always like there's the reader that's first right that reads all your code um and that yeah. is actually uh, outside of the compiler proper. Um, I think it's in the tool. What is a compiler proper? Okay, so when I think about the compiler proper, that's a good question. I think about the stuff that's in the closure closure script repo um, in GitHub, mm -hmm. and uh, but that of course that depends on things outside of it. And, and the one that I was thinking about initially is the reader. So that so the mm -hmm. the, st the code that reads um, reads your source, and um, you know turns it into forms that the compiler can deal with. That's actually outside of the compiler. That's in tools reader. Okay. To be honest, that part never really does ever come up for me in terms of like bugs, you know, that like there are, it happens every now and then, but that's like, uh, it, it typically just works kind of thing. Um, but you know, okay. if you wanted to start from the beginning, that's what I would say is that there's that bit of code that reads your code in. Um, and then after so whatever that, we, Whatever we compile or whatever we write sort of in the REPL, this is the part that reads the stuff and then it emits later on whatever else we need. Yeah, yeah. So then, um, so the next big chunk that I think about, and it's actually the biggest chunk in my mind, is the analyzer. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, and, and it's, uh, so, so we'll just kind of maybe name the parts before we go deeper into this stuff. But the analyzer is, is the next phase, if you will. Uh, and then mm -hmm. after that um, is what what you call the compiler. I have no clue why it's called the compiler, um, but it I think it's because it it um, takes the stuff that the analyze produced and compiles it down into stuff that can be executed. Um, but that's okay. That's the next phase, and mm -hmm. then after that is um, optionally I, I think of as just like the Google Closure compiler. Um, okay. That that you know would operate on the JavaScript that was produced uh, to optimize it. Um, okay. So those are, those are like right. the main, main chunks that I think of in terms of like the, the phase or the pipeline, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we would have the reader, then we have the analyzer, then we have the compiler, and then everything then is turned to the Google Closure compiler. That makes sense? Yeah, that's, that's roughly fair. That's the way I think of it. Mm -hmm. So the, the analyzer is the one that's probably, you know, worth talking about the most, uh, <laughs> okay. It seems like whenever I go into the compiler to to dig around and fix something or do something, that's the analyzer is the is is usually the the one where the interesting stuff is happening, or the mm -hmm. most. So what is what is the main main job of the analyzer? Yeah. Okay. So so it's essentially you could think of it as producing this uh, this AST data structure that represents uh, your code in a different form, if you will. So abstract, abstract syntax tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and if you say like, okay, what's, you know, what's like you think about your Lisp code, it's like a tree to start mm -hmm. off with. But so what's the real difference mm -hmm. with, with the AST that's produced by the analyzer? Um, it, mm -hmm. I, 
you know, at first plus, I would say it's like, it's, it's got like meaning in it. Like it knows, um, it, like you may have, you may have a let, right. And you're letting some locals, um, and with, when you've, when the analyzer is done analyzing your let, the, the fact that there actually are locals is in that AST that, you know, the, the, the semantic meaning that these, these particular symbols are locals and, and, uh, stuff like that ends up in the AST, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the same thing, but just so, richer and with more, more semantic information embedded in it. and a lot larger. The AST that gets produced is, is huge compared to your original code. Mm -hmm. So what did the, okay, so let's, let's try to roll back. So we try to, we'll probably do this a lot during this episode. So sure, yeah. we have the reader, mm -hmm. the reader reads the text or whatever we have, we pass it to, right. Mm -hmm. And then it turns this to a data structure. Mm -hmm. Then the analyzer takes the data structure and converts this to the AST. Yes. Yeah. And, okay. And while it's doing that, while it's converting it into the AST, other interesting things are happening in there. Um, one thing is um, that's when macro expansion occurs, is during analysis. Okay. Um, so as it's, you know, it's like, you know, you may have passed it a form, um, like a, let's say a win or a four, like the four macro, right? Um, right. That, the so the list comprehension? Yeah, the four list comprehension, that thing. Um, so the analyzer, um, it knows about uh, all the special forms that are uh, in the language, right? Of course, right. So, mm -hmm. so uh, if you take something like four, which is not a special form, it's a macro, um, the analyzer is the part where it says, oh, okay, this, this, this thing, this symbol at the beginning is actually a macro. Let me macro expand it. And, you know, it keeps recursively doing that until there's no more macros to be expanded. Um, maybe, maybe it would be good to say uh, what is a special form and what is a macro. Uh, okay, so a special form. Um, for using an example, if is a special form, um, and if is is kind of like a built-in thing that um, it's not a symbol, it's not a var, it's not referring to anything else. It's just like an intrinsic thing that's built into the language that the that the analyzer and the compiler understands inherently. Um, so would it make sense to say that the special forms are the ones that actually make the language or the programming language work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I, I don't know if this is a fair characterization, but if you think about like after you've macro expanded and, and you have everything expanded out, then you have either like special forms left over or uh, symbols that refer to other vars like function calls and whatnot. Um, and even those functions, you're right. Like if you go down to the bottom, all at the end, at the very bottom, it's the special forms that really make the the machine turn its gears. Right. So it's like building blocks of the language. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and what about macros? Uh, macros are just kind of like um, higher level, like template things that you can use to, um, you know, you can you can write uh, code that will expand to other code. So it turns out like a lot of the a lot of the things when you're programming and and, and you're using the core library, a lot of that stuff's actually mm -hmm. macros as opposed to mm -hmm. function calls. Um, okay, so whenever we would have any kind of code in our applications, that would be just we would be repeating ourselves too much. Uh, we could uh, write a macro that would help us with the verbosity of the code. Yeah, and, but I would even suggest like uh, it's a better practice even to write functions instead if you can, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's that's like definitely the, one of the main uses of macros is to like, um, as you said, like you have some verbose construct that you're repeating over and over again. You can you can just mm -hmm. you know if it if it's feeling like boilerplate, <laughs> you can take that and turn right. it into a macro. And just have that macro expand to that that boilerplate. Um, All right, so let's go back to the step where we mentioned that during the analysis, yeah. the macro expansion happens. Yes. So what does that mean? Uh, okay, so so the um, the analyzer is um, looking at the the forms that have been read by the reader, and it's just it's mm -hmm. it basically says, oh, okay, um, I need to like analyze this form, if you will. And the, one of the things that it'll do is it'll look at the very first, you know, if that form is a list of things, it'll look at the very first thing in that list and it'll say, is that, is that, um, symbol there? Is it, is that symbol actually a macro? Does it refer to a macro? Mm -hmm. And if so, mm -hmm. it 
it calls them it calls the macro right there because that's that's actually part of the magic is that the macro is just another function that takes a form and returns a form you know or takes arguments and it takes code and returns new code for you um so that's that's actually you know that's when people say like oh the compiler calls your macros right uh that's done in the analyzer part of the closure script compiler. okay so it expands all of the forms and it reads them and then what happens uh, let's see. So in the so there's other things that are occurring in the analyzer as well that are interesting. Um, there, mm -hmm. um, yeah. there are. Uh, that's where it's doing type inference, and okay, that's also where. Uh, so that's like if you think about it, like the analyzer is actually analyzing the meaning of your code, including like gaining a little bit of understanding about the types that are flowing through your code, um, mm -hmm. where it can statically, because uh, you know closure scripts a dynamically type language, but you know. Type inference does exist in the compiler. Um, yeah, and I think you spent a lot of time on this lately. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's fun to dig into it. Um, but that's that's a part of where, like, if if you ever um, if you if you're using Closure Script and you try to add a string and a number, um, literally, mm -hmm. where where the you know where it can see that 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 those are the two types involved, you'll get like these warnings that will appear. Um, that'll mm -hmm. say, hey, you know you. The plus operation takes numbers, right? And you're you're passing in something else. That is actually done at analysis time. Um, that's done in the analyzer. So all the warnings that appear that you ever see out of um, out of the closure script compiler, they're they're all in the analyzer. Um, okay. That's when it has the um, it has enough of the AST that it's built up to know that something went wrong, and it can complain and and issue a warning at that point in time. And that's, that's probably, so, you know, this, these things conspire to make the analyzer the biggest portion of all of this, in my opinion, because it's doing macro expansion, it's, it's doing type inference, it's emitting warnings. Um, mm -hmm. And well, how is, um, so how, so we talk about this type uh, macro expansion, how is the type inference helping us uh, to have this inside the uh, closure script compiler? Yeah, yeah. So um, fundamentally, um, you don't need type inference at all. Um, it's not necessary to make the language work. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, um, when I, I looked at the Git history recently, and I think the Closure Script compiler during the first year or so of its life didn't have any type inference at all. Type inference is used to uh, produce uh, more optimal JavaScript in the end. So, so if, you know, um, if you know the types of the things involved, then you can leverage that knowledge and emit more efficient JavaScript based on and the fact that you may know that something's a string. Um, and, and one, you might be wondering like, okay, give me an example, Mike, you know, like what is, <laughs> what is this? So um, one, one example of this is if you use the, um, if you use the STR function or it's actually a, a mm -hmm. function and a macro in Closure Script, but if you use that thing, uh, really it's you're concatenating strings using STR. And, mm -hmm. At one level, if you know that the things that you're passing to STR are already R strings, then when you concatenate them together, you you don't need to coerce them to strings. They already are strings. Um, as opposed to like if you pass a number to the STR function, the very first thing it's going to have to do is it's going to have to turn that number into a string before it can concatenate it with the other arguments that you have. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this explanation made sense, but... Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's okay. So good. So that's that's just an example. Like if you, um, if the compiler happens to know that there that that it, that one of the things that you're dealing with is a string, it can eliminate a coercion. Uh, the the oldest one in there, actually, the oldest uh, inference is used to. Um, I, I guess I have to back up to to try to explain this one. Is if you um, if you're doing an if in Closure Script, uh, and the thing that mm -hmm. you're testing. Um, is you know that's going to determine whether or not you go down to the then branch or the else branch, um, right? And um, it, closure script has its own notion of what is truthy and what's falsy, and that right. the semantics of that don't map directly to JavaScript. And in particular, where it goes wrong is if you if you take like the number zero, closure script zero is is truthy, <laughs> but in JavaScript it's false. <laughs> And that's correct. Yeah, I think there is seven uh, cases for JavaScript where it's falsy. 
uh, versus like the closure closure script is just null and false, nil and false, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so what the closure script compiler has to do, um, and this actually happens in the compiler part, which we'll talk about next, I guess, is it has to emit, mm -hmm. um, it has to emit an extra little bit of code to like uh, handle these cases that you mentioned, these seven cases. Mm -hmm. And to, to make a long story short, if the compiler knows that what you're passing to it is is like a, for example, a boolean value. Not passing to it. If if the test of the if is a boolean value, then mm -hmm. when it comes comes time to emit the JavaScript for that, it can it, it can um, elide that um, the check that would be put there. There's a little bit of code that it does to like translate to JavaScript. Um, it can it can basically get rid of that, and 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 that's all in the name of producing more efficient code in the end. Okay. Uh, but having said that, the other this also le leads to um, in the analyzer because it's doing type inference. It can also do type checking, and where that happens is with with the thing I had mentioned earlier with the numbers when you're adding when, whenever you're using like a numeric plus function. function yeah, th those are mm -hmm. those will basically uh, to make things fast. The compiler is going to emit direct use of JavaScript's plus and other numeric operators, and because of that, if you pass in things that are like if you try to pass a string or anything else to that. It's just going to emit garbage code that doesn't really have defined behavior. Or you could look up what the behavior is going to be in JavaScript, but that's not going to, you know, those are not closure script semantics. So, so at that mm -hmm. point, the um, the analyzer has a little bit of type checking, and it says, "Hey, <laughs> this thing that you're, you know, this this construct that you have in your code, it's analyzed it, and it sees that it doesn't statically type check, if you will, and it can emit a warning mm -hmm. at that point." Okay, so there were three things. I forgot one already. So there was the macro expansion, okay, the yeah, type yeah. inference, and the third one. Uh, let's see. So so let's see. I'm trying to remember too. So the analyzer does macro expansion. It does uh, type inference, type checking. It emits the AST. That's the main thing that it's really doing. You know. Okay. What else would would it do in there? Uh, I think that's 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 roughly it. And it's 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 okay. it's really at the bottom too. If you think about it, um, it's it's basically uh, bottoms out in all these cases that deal with all the special forms in the language, like the if. Mm -hmm. um, Is there anything special when it comes to emitting AST that we should talk about? I would just say it's like I, I think I had described earlier, where it's just basically emitting a lot of semantically rich information that, that effectively um, reflects the meaning of the code. Rather than just okay. being a so tree. So it's like a lot of metadata? A lot of metadata, yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. All right. I, I don't know. So how's the, what, how does it look like? How does the AST look like? Is it like a map? Oh, yeah. Or is it... That's a good point. Yeah. It is a map. It's a, it's a gigantic map. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the, um, a, that, thank you for mentioning that. A big part of what the way this all works is um, the, for, let's say you're, you're, the compiler is compiling a namespace, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. it's going through form by form, usually functions, right? You're, you have a bunch of defins in your name right. space. X expressions. Yeah, yeah. So as, that, as it's going through that, um, it's basically, you effectively have a bunch of defs that you're, that you're doing. As it goes through, as it's compiling that namespace, it's building up information about those defs. And for example, let's say you, you wrote a function that takes two arguments, right? You, you may have seen this error where if you actually call that function with either one or three arguments right. instead, you'll see the compiler will emit an errority warning. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's also kind of like, um, it's kind of, it's, it smells like type information, right? It's like, it knows that this function takes a certain number of arguments. So that's also being done in the analyzer. It's basically building up this map that you mentioned. Uh, that has all the information about each def that's in your namespace, and that um, that map is is thought of as compiler state. It's like as it's going through the namespace when it's compiling that namespace, it's building up the state uh, as it's you know hitting each def or def in, in your namespace, mm -hmm. and and that ultimately uh, ends up producing a, a huge map of information, AST stuff, and all that gets. Um, saved it gets cached to disk um and that's uh written out uh as in in your target directory when you're compiling um you'll end up mm -hmm. with with this stuff it's the compiler analysis metadata that gets written out uh, and that's all the the product of the analyzer and and the reason that's done 
is let's say you um, you compile a namespace, right? Uh, and later on, you run the compiler again. It wants to basically cache that information and, and reread it back in from disk, so that it can uh, so that you can use that namespace later on without having to recompile it mm-hmm. each time. So it's just a okay. pragmatic thing that it's doing. So now we are having this AST and we are taking this to the emission step that we mentioned. Exactly. Yeah. And that's called. And what happens there? That's called the compiler. Um, and okay. I I th- I think of it as being simpler than the analyzer in my mind. Uh, for whatever reason, it's just it actually it's like all the hard work's already been done at this point. Like it's got the AST, and now its job is to just emit JavaScript um, that that implements the um, you know the language semantics. And that sounds like that might be hard okay. to do. Right, you're like, oh man, you know, mm-hmm. you have to, like, you, yeah, you have to emit something that that implements a let, um, or or, and in that case, it it, it basically converts it into like, um, I think I think the way it does it is it creates a function and it has uh, local JavaScript variables inside there that are mm-hmm. associated mm-hmm. with each let bound thing. So a lot of these things, um, a lot of the the stuff at that point, fortunately, is pretty simple to map onto JavaScript. Um, if you have an if <laughs> that maps to a JavaScript if, okay. If you have like a case statement in Closure Script, that that yeah. will s- sometimes be turned into a a JavaScript switch. Right, that's the closest thing to it. But if it can't do that because your case constants are something else, then it will. Do like a or break down and do a an if else if else if else you know thing there. Right. It's I think a lot of this stuff is like you could kind of ma- imagine how it's done. Tries throw you know try and catch. I think map directly. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we when we do this step, so this is the compiler step. Uh, we how, how is this written inside? How we are just is this like strings or what? Yeah, yeah. It's actually um, it you know arguably it would it would probably be better if the compiler instead emitted um well i don't know if i should say it would be better but an interesting thought is if instead if it were to emit some sort of javascript ast and then let something else right. emit the javascript itself but for for better or worse worse what's actually happening at that point is it's building up strings <laughs> it's just the compiler is spitting out javascript fragments after enough of that's been done it's written an entire javascript file for each of your namespaces um and then we have this JavaScript created from the compiler, and then this is put inside the Google Closure compiler. Exactly. Yeah. So, so um, that that is uh, so in that case, it's kind of like uh, a conditional thing that that happens if you're doing like an advanced build, right? Um, but like you mm-hmm. could ask the question, like, what happens at the REPL um, if you're just like at the REPL using? Because all all the all the things we just now talked about occur when you're using mm-hmm. the REPL. Um, like you know, if you type a form into the REPL, it actually um, gets read, it gets analyzed, it gets compiled, and you know JavaScript gets pr- produced. Right, but uh, when we when we let's say shovel this to the Google Closure, uh, do we em- well we need to emit the Google Closure compatible JavaScript? No, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So so the compiler does does um, use very simple and constrained JavaScript that is compatible with with Google Closure. That is true. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you want to contribute actually to the compiler, you should also be familiar, or when you we should be familiar with the Google Closure. That's true to a certain extent. Um, um, yeah. So like, it, it's it's definitely the case that, uh, for example, you could you could contribute a change that could break things under advanced if um, if mm-hmm. you you know if you went off the rails right and you you made it emit some code or or alternatively if you're contributing to um, the core library, you might uh, contribute a change that uh, just doesn't work under advanced, right? All right. So this is the whole flow of the, well, closure script compiler. So we have the reader, which is just taking the text that you put in or you wrote in your files, Mm -hmm. and then it creates the data structure out of this. Then these data structures are analyzed and they produce the AST, which is this gigantic map yeah, it's huge. Yeah. with a lot of metadata. <laughs> yep. And then we have the compiler that takes this gigantic map, the AST, and then emits the Google Closure compatible JavaScript. Yes, exactly. Yep. 
And this is it. Like this is how we create our JavaScript bundles. Mm -hmm. And then the um, then at the very end, if you are doing an advanced build, um, it then mm -hmm. um, calls the Google Closure compiler um, to have it you know produce optimized JavaScript from that. Uh, right. And that's done. Uh, maybe the only thing that's really special about that is it's doing it. Um, in the JVM, it's like doing it in proc. The way the Google Closure compiler can normally be used is you download the jar, and it's like an executable jar, one of those that you can run from the command line, and you can just mm -hmm. say, "Hey, you know, process my files." Uh, but the but the Closure script compiler kind of has it built in as a dependency, if you will. It's using it as a library. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and and that's where um, like there's there's various options you could pass to uh, to Closure compiler google closure compiler and you can right. you can put those in your closure script compiler options and those will be passed all the way down at that point when it's using it as library so we have uh, so if you don't pass any option so there is a none i believe uh, so if you don't pass anything we just emit to javascript whatever it is mm -hmm. and we don't pass it to google closure compiler yeah so that's um that's typically like none is typically used when you're at the repl um, and, mm -hmm. and you, you're compiling things, but you want them to be written out to disk just so they can be used later on for use at the REPL. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's typically, uh, where none comes into play. Um, okay. Then we have basic. Yeah. So there's like, there's different levels for Google closure compiler. Um, there's like white space, simple right. and advanced. And, uh, all right. Yeah. I think most people probably use advanced, right? When they're, because that. That's right. the main if you don't use if you don't use a lot of stuff from npm or if you use shadow seal js then that's a different story also yeah so that's that's a whole yeah the whole thing about um how advanced interacts with other libraries um that's that's definitely a whole separate story and it's it's something to be aware of exactly right in enclosure script um so when we use this advanced compilation, this emits our bundle. So this is, I don't know, a main.js file. Yeah, you get one, one big concatenated JavaScript file at that point. Right. And this is then appended to our HTML page. Yeah. You or can, you we, can... we add a script tag. Yeah. That's, that's my understanding. Since I don't do web development, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm <laughs> being honest. I, I use ClojureScript for mobile apps. So... Um, and how does it work in the mobile world? It's the same thing, roughly. I mean, you just don't have an HTML, but like in you know, if you uh, if you want to, you can. I've I've done it like before React Native. I would use the compiler mm -hmm. to produce an advanced JavaScript, and then what I would do is I would just in in the mobile app, I would actually start up JavaScript core internally and have it uh, evaluate all that JavaScript. Um, okay. So yeah, it's it's. However, however you want to get your target environment to load that advanced file, um, you could do it that way. So I'm only only after joking, but it's true. <laughs> I don't do web development, so. Okay, yeah. so this thing that you just mentioned that you can evaluate this whole JavaScript is this is this called this self-hosted? No, no. So um, that's just like if you um, if you want to uh, load load the advanced JavaScript into um. Any target environment, any target JavaScript uh, environment, uh, mm -hmm. you you can just evaluate that and uh, and just you know then then all of a sudden um, the, all the stuff that you've implemented is now available in that JavaScript environment. You know it's been compiled down and, and it's in there now. But you know, so you mentioned self-hosted. That's um, the the interesting thing there is that um, well, first of all, you can't do advanced. Um, with with self hosting, okay. And what's what's really going on there is the um, everything we talked about, the analyzer and the compiler and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all written in Closure, right? Um, and uh, what was it like three or four years ago? Uh, reader conditionals were added to the language. Um, the, like mm -hmm. you know, you could do you could have little conditional branches where you can say like. If this is compiled under Closure, take the CLJ branch. Um, if it's compiled under Closure Script, take the CLJS branch. Um, right. So this is the pound signed question mark. Exactly. Yeah. And once mm -hmm. that was added to the language, then the immediate question you could ask is: Could you take all the code that's in the analyzer and the compiler and whatnot, and could you make it so that that code is compilable as if it were Closure Script instead of Closure? 
And if you look at it, the bulk of it is just straightforward, simple code. Uh, and, you know, if you sprinkle enough reader conditionals in that code to like, you know, say, okay, if you're in the JVM compiler, you know, take the CLJ branch and you do some Java interrupt. Uh, but if you're, mm -hmm. if you're compiling this thing as closure script, um, take the CLJS branch and do something else that's appropriate in the JavaScript uh, engine. Uh, and then what you end up with basically is the fact that you can take the analyzer and the compiler and enough of the surrounding stuff and make it so that you can compile all that stuff down to JavaScript. And then it's kind of mind bending. Then what you can then do is you can use the analyzer and the compiler um, from JavaScript, if you will, uh, in your target environment. So you can you can effectively that's that's where we came. You know, it started being called bootstrapped or self hosted. Um, and you can effectively uh, compile code from within the the target JavaScript environment. Uh, and all right, let me stop you here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait. So we are doing all of the steps that we discussed. So it's like reading, analyzing, and then compiling. And we are emitting with JavaScript all of the stuff that we need. Mm -hmm. Then we are taking this bundle, and then we are reading it via this JavaScript that help us to produce this bundle. And then we are self-hosting. Uh, so maybe a, a simpler way to say it is that you can take the analyzer and compiler themselves. Normally, they're being mm -hmm. used to uh, compile some other program, right? The, the one that you've written that you're that you're working on. But you can take the analyzer and compiler themselves and feed them back through <laughs> the analyzer and compiler and produce uh, a JavaScript form of them. So, so basically, right. you've taken the analyzer and compiler with you into your target environment. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and in the end, it All kind right. of ends up behaving more like closure where like in closure, you have the compiler there with you, right? At runtime, mm. you know? So, but, but it, it effectively lets you in the, in the end, it lets you have things like, um, for example, um, in iOS, you really can't have a JVM there with you. I, I guess you can, if you wanted to, but you know, you have JavaScript core there at, at your disposal. So if you can, mm -hmm. if you can compile the analyzer and the compiler down to JavaScript, then you can use it um, in in mobile apps, and you can have self-hosted, you know, compilation occurring in your mobile app. Um, so like Replete um, is on iOS and also on Android, and those are just little REPLs where you can compile directly on your phone. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's because of what we were just discussing. All all this stuff that we just talked about has been compiled down to JavaScript and is usable. Um, in that target environment. This is really mind bending, uh, especially for a person who's not, uh, not been doing this as you were. And then I think, uh, if you look for visual representation, I know there is a very good talk by Maria Geller that has like the visuals, how exactly this works. Yeah. That, that was great. Yeah. Maybe you can also point people there. Um, so what are the other ways we could actually contribute to, uh, Closure script compiler, if we really don't want to get inside uh, all of the analyzer and the reader and all of the things we discussed. Outside of the compiler itself, the analyzer and the compiler, there's the standard library that's part of uh, what's in this repo that we've been talking about. Like, you know, all the functions that you use, like map and reduce, all that stuff's in there. So these are, these are the same functions as we have in closure. Yes. Yeah. So, um, those, uh, those are also um, places where people can contribute. Uh, you can, like if you, if you found a bug in a standard function, you know, you could contribute, contribute a fix to the bug. Um, you could, um, there's always like interesting performance optimizations that can be made in the standard library. That's kind of a nice way to contribute is if you, if you find something that just happens to be inefficient, um, oftentimes you can find a better way by just changing the standard library a little bit. Um, like one example is like some of the functions uh, will test something about an argument. And if you look at the big picture, that function will behave differently if the argument was was nil. Um, and I've, I've seen a lot of uh, places where uh, in those standard library functions, it will just immediately do a check to see if that argument's nil. And if so, um, mm -hmm. return nil or whatever it was going to do. Those kind of like rearrangements of code right. tend to make things run faster in there. 
Um, so talking about the standard library, um, how normally, because Closure Script actually tries to keep up always with Closure, right? So how does new functionality end up in Closure Script? Yeah, so like like whenever anything new uh, is introduced in Closure, like um, transducers or spec or, you know, any of these things mm -hmm. here, they, they typically are just uh, copied over, right? You know, directly into the closure script standard library. And then of course changed as necessary to make, you know, make them work there if, if any changes are needed. So, so that's, that's also an area where, um, as new things come out in closure or just changes in closure. Like if you, if you watch there's like closure has its own, its own Jira and sometimes things will be changed in closure that affects closures standard library. Right. And, mm -hmm. and those things can be ported over to closure script. So, when I do, when there's any change in Clojure, and since both of those libraries are written in Clojure, it's just copy and paste. Usually, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's oftentimes just that, exactly. You just can copy and paste and test it out, make sure it works. How about any kind of stuff when it comes to NPM? Yeah, so any, like, the, so what we largely talked about is more at the core of Closure script, like the, the analyzer and the compiler and whatnot. But a big part of the way the, the closure script compiler works, if you will, is how it interacts with everything around it, you know, how it's how it consumes libraries. Um, and, and NPM is one of those. So there's a there's a feature in um, in the closure script compiler where it can consume NPM depths. Mm -hmm. And that part relies a bit on Google Closure to pull that off. Um, but that's, that's an area where it's very easy to find something that that's broken. Like you may say, oh, I want to, I want to use this library from M NPM. Oftentimes you can either dig into it and fix something in the closure script compiler, whatever might be breaking that, or you might be able to, to solve it by contributing back to the originating library that you're trying to consume. Maybe it's got a little bit of code in it that's causing the train to go off the tracks, but that's a, that's a huge area that, um, is still very broken in, in, um, in the closure script compiler. So that's, you know, if you're trying to use a library and, and you find something that doesn't work in that area, um, contributions are always welcome in that, in that area. Yeah, I think it's a challenging problem uh, when it comes to NPM. And as we talked, uh, this is why I think Shadow CLJS gets so popular. Yes, definitely. Because it just has this has this approach saying like, you know, this is what I'm going to do with NPM packages and you can just use them and don't worry about it. So, so Shadow has like a, a, um, a cleaner integration story with that where it, it largely uses things uh, the way they were kind of meant to be used, right? Right. So, I mean, you contributed a lot uh, to the Clojure, Clojure script library. Uh, do you have any like best practices? What's the best way to do it? Maybe some kind of, I don't know, small tips? So if, if you're going to like make a patch, right? And, and so Clojure script mm -hmm. uses Jira. And, and the way it works is you would um, put together a change and you would create a patch. There's instructions on, on the ClojureScript.org website on how to actually produce that patch. Um, but the suggestions I'd make is like if you, if you do that, you know, try to make your patch simple and limited in scope. And then the main theme is to try to make it easier on the reviewer. Try to make it easy to, for people who are looking at your patch to, to understand what it's doing. Um, if, if needed, add some ex explanation in the ticket to say like, here's, you know, here's the strategy that my patch is taking, you know, here's, here's why it works and you know, how it, how it pulls it off. Um, that, that always just makes it so much easier rather than like, you know, you could, uh, you could create a patch that ends up being like a puzzle for the reviewer to solve and look at and like, right. That, that's always like a challenge because we all have like very limited time. And, um, so it, anything you can do to make it easier to like, to clearly see like how your patch fixes something that hel that helps make it easier to, to, to review it, um, and, and get it in there. Um, you, you know, writing, writing tests, of course, surrounding your patch helps, helps as well along those lines. It m makes, it gives confidence that your patch is actually, um, fixing things in the correct way. Okay. And how about, I don't know. So when we do this patch and we limit the scope, are there any testing practices we should follow? Yeah. So there's, when you're producing your patch, you could just like, you know, there, there is a REPL that you can run with the closure script compiler and, and you can quickly just say like, oh, let me, ch let me just like in that REPL test to see if, if my patch fixes whatever problem you're trying to fix. But there's a whole. Is this any special? Is this any special REPL? Uh, 
it's it's uh there's a node REPL. That's the one that I typically use inside there. Just you know, like if you're making a change and you're like just curious, like did your patch mm-hmm. fix it or not? Um, it's it's oftentimes you can just quickly hop into that REPL and, and check to see like hey did it, did it do it or not? Um, mm-hmm. but then outside of that, there's like unit tests in the compiler and and all those um. There's basically a there's a set of instructions that you can follow on the Closure Script Org website on how to set up all the JavaScript target JavaScript environments like you know Node and JavaScript Core, um, Spider Monkey, all these things. You can set them up, and then you can make sure that that the patch that you're putting together uh, works in all those JavaScript virtual machines. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a whole there's a cool system that that's fairly recent. Um, it's been there for a few years now, but it's it's the Canary system, and it's essentially um, several a whole handful of open source projects that are um, that you know they have their own unit tests, um, but they're all collected together in this Canary uh, system, where you can have a a version of the Closure Script compiler built with your patch. And then you can see if your patch breaks any of those downstream systems, right? So who's providing this canary? That is just contributors to Closure Script. The main person who did that is he goes by Darwin. Um, his name's okay. Anton Hildebrand, I think. Um, he he gets okay. the credit for putting most of that together. Uh, but it's it's it is a it's another GitHub project that uses um, Circle or I'm sorry, Travis to to run the the downstream tests um it's really just a collection of all, of several open source projects out there and it's just a mechanism to run them all against a specially built version of the compiler that has your patch in it so you can see you know okay so this is how we will test the correctness how about performance yeah so um one thing is you know if like if you're making a change to uh the standard library especially if you're just trying to like make it, uh, if you're trying to improve the performance of a particular function, you really do need to like test it across a lot of different um, JavaScript virtual machines. So there's, um, mm-hmm. there are some benchmark, um, there's some benchmark suites set up inside the Closure Script compiler. And, you know, let, let's say you had a function, let's say pick one, like maybe like four, <laughs> you know, you're trying to improve the performance of four. And what you can do is you can like write a little benchmark test and then, you know, you can you can run your test without your patch, and then run it with your patch, and see how much faster it got, right? Um, mm-hmm. But then the immediate question becomes like, well, what which JVM is that, or I'm sorry, which JavaScript virtual machine is is that? Um, are you seeing that performance benefit in? So we have in the Closure Script compiler, we have like this setup where you can run your stuff a, a, across all these machines, like you know. JavaScript core and whatnot, and you can you you'll you'll see different performance characteristics out of them. Usually, if you're if you're lucky, if you're if you're doing a performance patch, it'll it will speed up on all of them. But sometimes, you know, you'll have a patch that will like speed up on some and maybe slow down a little bit on others. So it's always good to test across that. And then and then outside of that, I guess that so that that's like if you're making a change in the standard library. Um, there's also the case that you may make a change to the compiler itself. <laughs> <laughs> and that may slow down the compiler, right? So it's like the performance of the compiler for like developers, right? In terms of how fast it is while you're developing. Okay, so we also so we also do performance tests of that. Yeah, there's and that there's not a whole lot of infrastructure surrounding that on how to test that. One thing I do is I there's this this body of code that I have. It's like a quarter of a million lines of code. It's called coal mine, <laughs> and I'll just see like how long does it take the compiler to compile all that code? It takes like 10, right. 10 minutes or so. So like if you know. If you make a change to the compiler and all of a sudden it's taken 20 minutes, then you probably slowed something down, you know? <laughs> right. Well, I think all of this is uh, adding up. I think you really need to uh, spend some time actually with the compiler and the core, li- core library and actually the whole setup uh, to really contrib- contribute. Um, are there any like other ways that someone uh, can actually get in and then just what would be the way if someone wants to contribute? What would be the smallest changes that we can do and start and are there any issues that someone can tackle yeah so so one thing we do is there like if there's a ticket that's pretty simple a lot of tickets have to do with like doc string changes those those kind of tickets that are fairly simple are marked as newbie tickets so you can always go search for those and that that's a great way to like just you know get involved in like how the whole process works right 
right. you know, like how to put together a patch, how to, you know, how to test things and all that kind of stuff. So if you go and look for the, for the newbie tickets, those are great to get involved with. Another thing you can do is you can just, um, it, it helps is if you just are interested, you can go and you can get some patches from existing tickets and you can try them and see if they work. You know, that's, that's one way to okay. get involved and like see how things work. This would be the way that, you know, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to do anything. You just get your, or, uh, well, you need to run the patch, but you don't have to write the code. So you, you start to get your feet wet. Exactly. Yeah. And then you start to understand how this machinery works together. And then probably you can get some help from, uh, from the tickets and stuff like that. To be honest, that's extremely valuable. Like if you were to run some of these patches and you confirm that they work for you, then you could go back and you could, you could comment in those tickets and say, hey, this worked for me. And that just adds more assurance that that patch is a good patch, right? Mm. It's, it's a valuable contribution to make. Right. So were there any memorable patches that you did to the ClojureScript compiler? Yeah, so there's, so, so there's this, this idea that if you um, put together a patch you may want to let it sit around for a while. And there's one that I'm remembering that I can think of that um, it involved uh, doing proper type inference for uh, the AND and OR macros. Okay. And for that particular one, uh, I, I remember like running like millions and millions of iterations on tests to see like, or, or different cases of different types of values to those macros to, to be sure that, that the... Um, that the that the type inference algorithms for those macros w was producing the right answer, basically. And when I when I did that, like I found that like ah, oh, there's I actually was getting it wrong. Some of my changes weren't right, so I actually went and adjusted the patch, you know, to 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 fix those. Mm -hmm. and, and and the and the code needed to pull that off got more and more complicated, right? To the point where it was like mm. hard to actually right. understand any longer how it works, right? Uh, but it was but with enough of those changes uh, and enough of that extensive testing. It, it started to produce the right answers. Um, and that one's mem memorable to me because uh, it was a fairly complicated patch. And, and these kind of patches, when they're that complicated, you just want to kind of like let them sit there for a long time, right? You don't want to like mm -hmm. jump the gun and, pu and push them into the computer. Right. So that patch was attached to the ticket. And, I, and it, was, it sat there for like more than half a year, maybe three quarters of a year. And then I was working on something else with type inference Related to so there's this there's this inference algorithm now where if um, if the compiler can deduce that a value is well it'll know that it's truthy because it's being used in a test right in an if test mm -hmm. and it's going to take the yeah. branch and if if you know that a value is truthy then you know that it can't be nil you know that the value can't be nil um, so there's a there's a little bit of a type inference algorithm that will in the then branch eliminate eliminate the possibility that, that the value can be nil in the, in the type information that it's carrying along at that point. And it turns out, uh, to make a long story short, that so that, that patch was actually like a three-line patch <laughs> to, do, to pull that off. And it turns out okay. that that one little patch took care of almost all the cases that that other patch took care of mm -hmm. in, in just a much simpler way. Uh, so that other patch was not even really even necessary or worth doing anymore. So the main, the main theme there, I would say, is like if you're working on a patch, <laughs> that seems pretty complicated. Yeah. You know, just it, it, it's worth uh, just letting things sit around for a while. Or mm -hmm. if you have a patch, before even before even attaching a patch to a Jira, try it out in your own projects for like a week or something. You know, and that'll give you a chance to think about it and sleep on it, and and perhaps think of a better way. Because this has happened to me many times, to be honest. I'll, I'll come up with a patch uh, and I'll say like, oh, this is great. And I'll go and attach a patch to Jira, assign it to David Nolan to review it. And then after that, like within a few hours, <laughs> think about like, oh, man, I should have I done this differently. So I've learned over right. time not to do that anymore. <laughs> All right. All right. So next time, just take your time. That's, the th that's a good way of putting it. Take your time. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so still, if someone finds it very difficult to uh, contribute to the compiler, the analyzer, the standard library uh, to do the patches, they, you can always review them. There are also newbie tickets. And uh, there is also the documentation 
uh, that we can contribute to. So what's the story behind contributing to the uh, site documentation? Yeah, so that, um, so the site, well, first of all, I would say is that it could use some help. Like it, it's really easy, like if you're reading through the site to find things that could be improved, typos or just better ways to explain things. And that whole site is backed by a GitHub repo. And you can go in there. And actually in the site, there's a little there's a little part in the end where it describes how to contribute to the site itself. But uh, suffice it to say that that's a real easy way to contribute. Um, all you have to do is uh, GitHub has this, uh, this feature where um, you can um, just effectively go in there and it's almost like you're going to edit the site. And what it'll do is it'll make a small fork of the site and it'll let you right. make a change and submit that back. I don't know what that feature is in GitHub, but it's really cool. Um, if you're making a larger change, you know, like one that, that spans several paragraphs, you might just want to like fork it and, and submit a, a, you know, a full PR with that change. Right. Right. It will give you like this markdown editor and then you can just, you know, modify the stuff. This is what you're talking about. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's like really, it makes it trivial. Like, especially if you just see like a typo, you can just quickly go in there and like use that feature to submit a fix to a typo. You don't even have to like, you know, fork it. it it's doing that behind the scenes, I think, but it's like, yeah, so much simpler. Cool. Is there anything else how we could encourage people to help with the closure script compiler? Uh, well, one other thing I would think of is like if you find a bug, just write tickets. That helps too. Um, write good tickets, right? You know, to be honest, I think like if you if you encounter a bug, you may not even have a Jira account yet. I, I would say go ahead and make one. You know, create an account in there. I guess it's worth it. That's that's the that's the only way that these things get fixed, right? Is just to know that there are defects. Um, so if someone is interested in contributing, there is, I think, the whole page on the uh, ClojureScript.org website that describes all of the process that's true, and what yeah. needs to happen. Yeah. Uh, so I think we can, uh, we can just leave it at that, actually. We can tell people just to go there and try it out. So I think this episode helped people to better understand the ClojureScript compiler. Uh, Mike, it's been it's been really a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, yes, thank you. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we can just stop it here. All right, cool. Thanks, thanks. If you find this podcast valuable, there are many ways you can support it. You can review it on iTunes or any other platform you're listening to. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can blog about it, discuss it on your own podcast, and you can support it directly by buying my video courses and learning ClojureScript and Clojure at my website, jacekshare.com. That's J-A-C-E-K-S-C-H-A-E.com. Thank you for your support of this show.